different way. Hey, good morning, church. I want to invite you to stand if you're able. I'm going to let those folks know at home we're having some technical if, uh, difficulties, but hang in there with us as we worship and praise God today. Let us stand and worship.
that searched the world But it couldn't fill me A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough When you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, yes, I know. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of Nothing is
right, if you could have a seat and gain an attitude of prayer, let us, let us pray. God, we give you thanks and we, we recognize that your son, Jesus Christ, is our king. We thank you for being our God. We know that uh, all power belongs to you. All authority belongs to you in heaven and on earth. So I ask, oh Lord, to come. Come and rule our hearts. And help us to forward your kingdom here on earth. Gracious God, you are the King of glory. You are the eternal Son of the Father. We give you praise for that you have conquered the darkness over death. You have opened your kingdoms to all believers. We offer you, O Lord, our obedience. We offer, O Lord, our love. And we, we do seek to live in your glory. So, Lord, grant that your church may be an instant instrument for the coming of your kingdom here on earth. Lord, we pray for all who are seeking to bring peace and goodwill to your creation. Today, O oh Lord, we lift up all the rulers of nations and people that they may be open to your will, that they may govern with grace. We remember all who are striving for freedom, all who are seeking to improve your creation, O oh Lord, all who are working to relieve poverty. We look we look for the day that when the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of Christ. We pray for those who create, O oh Lord. We pray for all artists, those who are craftsmen, musicians, sculptures, architects, and gardeners. That God... You created in your creatures a sense of creation. And so may your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. Lord, come and rule our homes. Come rule in our lives and our relationships. Come rule in our everyday dealings. Come rule in our hearts. Come, O Lord, and change us, and we shall be changed. Gracious God, we ask that your blessings be on those folks who are divided, all who are suffering from war or oppression, differences of opinion that they can't see the face of the other through. We remember all who are struggling and cannot cope on their own. Lord, Lord, give comfort and strength to all who are ill, especially those who are fearful in their illness. We pray for friends and for loved ones, especially those who are in need at this time. You, O oh Lord, you are the King of glory. You've triumphed over death. You have defeated the darkness. You have redeemed us by your love. And we commend you and all your loved ones, especially our friends who are departed from this life. Oh God, we rejoice in your kingship. We serve a risen Savior with gladness and in love. And may that peace that passes all understanding given by your Holy Spirit unite us, not only in heart, but today in voice, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Well, good morning. It's great to see you this morning. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm, one, I'm Buck Cuny Smith. I almost forgot that. But it's uh, good that you are, are with us today. I'm going to remind if there's anyone the age that uh, wants to go with Miss Carla during our children's church, you can do that at this time and, and uh, you get an age appropriate message. And, and today I hope you get an age appropriate message, but uh, it's good here. We continue in our sermon series, actually it's the conclusion today of our, uh, our stewardship sermon series called At the Table. And, and I, I'm just going to say it. I think the church has done an injustice with the word stewardship. That anytime we think stewardship, we think about finances. And, and, and the true fundamental belief or, or what stewardship stands for is really caretaker. We are the caretakers of the world. And so there's our pledge cards that are in the uh, uh, pew pockets, um, the hymn pockets in front of you. There'll be later time uh, when we bring down our offerings. If you'd like to put the pledge card in these plates as well, we'll do this in the, in the next songs. But I invite you to do that. Uh, but it's just not about your financial. It, it, it's when we become members of the church, we promise to be stewards of it, to take care of it. And so we, we uphold it through our prayers, our presence, our gifts, service, and witness. And, and that's what uh, we, we were created to be caretakers for God's creation. And it's through those gifts. And so it's, it's bigger than just financial. It's, it's taking care of one another as well. It, it, for those who are beside you, in front of you, behind you, in the pews, it's seeking and caring after one another as well. And so uh, this app table, it, it's been the theology of food. It's been theology of the table and how the table means um, it's the practice of gathering around the table. And understanding that there needs to be vulnerability. There needs to be some, some sharing that happens at the table. Uh, communion is probably the largest or the biggest thing the, the, around the table that the church does. Uh, the United Methodist Church has two sacraments, one being baptism and one being communion. And, and with that, it, it has an importance. It shares our unity and in fact, it, 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 it comes because it's an integral part of the church. We learn this from our, our, our forefathers and mothers. Our, our, the early church, it, it reads in Acts that they met together and ate. I, I think that is important. Now, because the church grew so large, it, it grew so big that they, couldn't, they stopped serving a meal. The church would have a meal, and then they'd practice communion together. And so our scripture lesson today is kind of interesting. It, it, I'm, I'm going to ask you to just take it tongue-in-cheek, because I'm going to tell you that Paul was writing to the church in Corinthians. But if we need to hear this message, it, it seems a little scolding. In fact, I, I think Paul's ticked when he's writing the church because of some things that have happened. And when it comes to the table, the table communion, taken from the King James Version, uses this Greek word called koinonia. And koinonia is the word that we get communion from, which is also can be shared or interpreted as the word shared because we share with each other. We just don't pass the plate, right? I, don't, I haven't seen them in quite a while. There used to be a restaurant. What was it, what was it called? The Black Eyed Pea or, or something that you sat down and they brought everything to you family style? They're, well, it's gone too. But there's that, you know, that mall that used to be down on the 71 Highway where Cerner is now. That mall's gone. But there was a restaurant there that, that you served families. You shared and that's what the word for communion is with that. And so there's some things that are happening in the church in Corinth. They're, they're withholding communion from people. So here, here, here's a listen to this. Paul confronts the Corinth church over their partiality at the table, their hierarchical understanding of what the table is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, it starts this way. 
the following directives I have, no praise for you. For your meeting do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there is divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and others get drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this modern, in this matter. So Paul uh, admonishes them. Paul goes on and, and says, but then what he wants to do is every admonishment comes a lesson and a, a bringing forth to bring us together. And so he reminds us of what Jesus Christ did to set the communion table, the Lord's. Set. So he continues in verse 20, 23, it says, for I've received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. So here is my teaching. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord is unworthy, is an unworthy manner we will guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. See, when we look at this, Paul is speaking out to a church that, that is separating. And one thing you have to understand about the, the first church is that the first church met together as a mill, as I said earlier, and then they had communion. Uh, it comes from the early Jewish church. Before they were Christian, uh, Jewish had two worship services linked together in the middle by a, a pastoral prayer or what is called an intercessory prayer. They had the the service of the word where they went through the Torah and they read and the preacher preached. Sound familiar? Then they had an inter intercessory prayer and then they had what was called the service of the table. It was a thanksgiving for God providing for them and it was a dinner. And then our church then made it simple into the bread and cup. What... Paul is telling them and Paul is discussing of the Lord's Supper is that he suggested that it, it, it is part of a ceremonial act that we come together and eat. It, 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 in the second century, this word meal also could be translated agape. Now, some of us may know that word from uh, vacation Bible school. Agape means love. And, and so the, the terminology of communion was also created to say love feast. That they, it, it, for some of you, how many of you think about what you do this Thursday as a love feast, right? I mean, some of you like turkey, some of you put up with it. Some of you have your special thing that you have to have to make it Thanksgiving. But really, what's important is hopefully the ones around the table, the ones that we share with, that word communion, that word koinonia that comes with us, those ones around the table. See, for the Corinthians, the love feast no longer marked love, it marked selfishness. It was uh, overindulging, it was becoming drunk, it was eating food before the rest of the people arrived. So, in fact, let me put it this way, which is, I don't think a sin 
It was eating dessert first, so you know you'd get some, right? The Corinthians wanted everyone to know who was rich and who was poor and who was worthy of the table. But Paul is reminding them that this meal is meant to honor God, not an excuse to overindulge. The interesting thing is there's, when you study communion, and especially the communion that we have on the first Sunday of the month here, there's this Greek word, it's called epiclesis or apoclasia, and it's a weird little prayer. Maybe if you've heard me preside over the table, you've heard me say it. it it's asking God through the Holy Spirit to come down and enter into the bread and into the cup. Now, because of this, the weirdest thing happens in theological uh, uh, discussions. I don't know about you, but I've been asked a number of times, if Jesus becomes the bread and the cup and we eat them, are we cannibals? For that epiclesia, it's an understanding that Jesus is present with us. When we ask the Holy Spirit to come down and enter into the bread and cup, we are reminded that Jesus is here worshiping with us, that Jesus is a part of our fellowship, that Jesus is a part of understanding that his presence is here also worshiping God. But then the next part of this epiclesis of this prayer is an understanding that, well, whenever I ate anything bad, junk food, candy. My grandmother had this saying, and maybe you've heard it. You are what you eat, right? Yeah, you are what you eat. Well, you know, I'm eating, I'm, I'm sucking on a dum-dum that I got from Halloween still, right? But it is. It's an understanding that the first part is asking Jesus to join us and be part of the bread that communes with us. But also, we are what we eat. When we take a piece of the bread and we take a, a sip from the cup, we recognize that we are the body of Christ. We are Jesus in the flesh. When we leave these walls, we are to carry on his mission. We are to care for those. We are to use those teachings that we are the presence of God. Now, the weirdest thing that has happened is a couple of years ago, a long time ago, um, Colleen and I and a pastor and his wife used to run a family camp up at Wilderness in Lawson. And, and at the last night... We had a chapel service where we had communion, and the epiclesia happened, and, and Kevin broke the bread, and he said something that I'd never really thought about. He said, y'all come get you some Jesus. I, I didn't find the bread all that appetizing, right? But we're talking representative. We're talking that when we know that God's presence is with us and we know that the connection of us having a common meal together, that we're the body of Christ, that we are what we eat, but it's more it's our, we are of how we're connected, of how we shared and how we have communion together. Henry Nouwen, a spiritual guru in my mind, he once wrote a, a new prayer. Uh, listen to these words as he, he wrote this epiclesia for a communion setting. He says, Dear Lord, isn't my faith in your presence in the breaking of the bread meant to reach out beyond a small circle of my brothers and sisters of humanity to alleviate suffering as much as possible? If I can recognize you in the sacrament of communion, I must also be able to recognize you in a hungry man, in a starving woman, in a child in need. If I cannot translate my faith in your presence, 
under the appearance of bread and wine, into the action of the world, I'm still an unbeliever. I pray, therefore, Lord, deepen my faith in your communion presence and help me find ways to let this faith bear fruit in the lives of many. I love that part where he says, if I cannot translate my faith into your presence under the appearance of bread and wine at the table into action in the world, I am still an unbeliever. See, moments of fellowships are important. Our John Wesley, our founder, called them means of grace. Besides communion and baptism, there's fellowship, there's service, there's an understanding of how we understand grace when we live out life together, when we do life together better. There's no social climbing, no political agenda, no racism. There's only remembrance of a God who was slain so we could live. Long time ago, like the Corinthians that Paul had to admonish, John Wesley, the founder of United Methodist, found him in a church, serving a church in Bristol where he was an associate pastor, not the head pastor. And the head pastor made a decision that no one poor and no one under the age of 18 could get communion. Now, you've got to understand a little bit about our founder, John Wesley. If he, lived, if he lived today, I believe he'd either be president or in a mental institution. Right? That was supposed to be funny. Right? Because he, he, he had this, he, he dabbled in holistic healing. He had a clinic called the New Room in Bristol. And when the senior pastor of the church said no one could get communion who was poor or under the age of 18, he started serving communion in the new room in Bristol and opened it up. It became so popular, and I know, just bread and juice. People wanting, as Kevin said, what? Come get you some Jesus. People wanted that so much they had to give out tickets so they knew how much bread and wine to get before time. When I served in the British Methodist Church, I still had to hand out communion tickets, mainly because it was just tradition and not because it was all that, well, a fad or popular. See, when we come, there's this kind of community that cannot dissolve petty conflict and agreement. But when we come to the table, we come to the table with Christ and we, we have to recognize that we're at a table that's bigger than ours. It extends a place beyond and around the entire world. Only when that we understand the fellowship that Christ is present, that this holy meal shared together is a pentacle of fellowship. See, I firmly believe that when Jesus himself wanted to explain that he had to die on a cross for our sake, he didn't say, get out your notepads, your college rule paper, three-ring binder, and get out a pen, and I'm going to give you some notes. What did he do? He invited his disciples into an upper room and shared his news over a meal. The table is important. So this week, as you go to the table, remember that God, uh, Christ is present there. We are what we eat, and we become the body of Christ. Maybe not over the food, per se, but over the fellowship that we share. Let us pray. Gracious, most loving God, Feed us. Feed us that we may become your presence here on earth. That in doing so, that the people will meet and know that your presence, your grace, your strength is within us. As often as we gather at the table, Lord, remind us that we are yours. And you provide for us. 
and allow us to understand the other by inviting new people to the table, by keeping a chair open for some who may come late. Lord, touch us and drive us to do your will. But in so much that our fellowship, our growth, our understanding of you grows in communication with the other. So God, be with us. And we give you thanks through your son, Jesus Christ, who is delivered through the Holy Spirit to worship with us. And when we partake of his bread and cup, we become his body. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. During this song, if you have a pledge card or an offering, you can bring it up, and there's also plates in the back at this time. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a one.
A few announcements for this week. Next Saturday at 9 a.m., we're going to come to church and decorate. If you'd love to help get in the Christmas spirit, we'll welcome you to do that. And so come and decorate next Saturday at 9 a.m. Also, just to let you know is that there will be an Advent study going on during Advent. And so it is, you can either have a choice. It's either Monday at 6.30 p.m. or Wednesday at 10 a.m. You're not required to go to both. There's one or the other if you'd like an Advent study, and that starts the week after uh, Thanksgiving. And so if you don't mind, if you're able, will you please stand and receive the benediction? Go from this place. As you go out into the world and know that you are the body of Christ, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. And God's people said, amen. amen.
Jesus, and we.